Hi folks, in this video I'm going to give an overview of web security and give a bit of an overview of the kind of the overall picture of web security and the technologies that are used to build websites and um, you know talk about really the core technologies involved and help you to understand the relationship between like servers and clients when we're talking about web browsers and web servers and what's happening where. Um, and this is really going to lay the foundations for building on your knowledge for future topics. So when we're looking at things like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, cross-site request forgery, you know, all that stuff really relies on um, a good understanding of the fundamentals of how websites work. So those are the things we're going to cover today. And um, as um, seems appropriate, um, there's a picture of a, a redback spider, which is the kind of spider um, that was common around where, where I grew up. So, you know, as time's gone on, more and more technology has moved to being based on web technologies. So, you know, we've been using, you know, IT um, as core components of, of organizations for, you know, quite a few decades now. Um, but the, the move, the way that we're implementing technologies has slowly moved more and more towards web technologies. So things that might have previously been done on kind of systems, raw TCP IP type stuff, we've moved over time to being more and more based on web technologies. Um, and so, you know, websites and web apps are incredibly popular at the moment. And even, web, even applications that look like native apps, um, actually a lot of the time are still based on web technologies. So if you install uh, a lot of mobile apps, um, that they're actually basically just talking to a web server um, via the um, like a server API, and which we'll get to um, shortly. But you know that they're, they're still based on web technologies. And one of the things about um, everyone having their own website is that they're often bespoke, so you get a lot of code that's written for specific organizations. And when there's new code, there's more opportunity for security problems. Um, but they'll all also often be based on various frameworks, so like JavaScript frameworks, or like libraries of code that have been pre-written, and content management systems, so things like WordPress that make it easy to build websites. And kind of the thing that comes along with all of that is that we're using a set of technologies that has a specific set of security problems and specific things that you need to think about for security, which is what we're going to cover. Um, on the topic in this in this video and um, future topics. So the fundamental idea is uh, websites are based on a client server architecture. So you have clients that connect to the server um, via TCP connections. Um, and so it's an application level protocol, which means that there's all the technology stack that is involved in TCP IP communications. Um, but sitting on top of all of that is um, the website. So, you know, we can kind of take the TCP IP thing for granted. It gives us a way of communicating. On top of that, we connect on port 80 and we have this like text based protocol, um, which is um, HTTP, which you can basically um, request a website and it responds back with a website. Um, and if we want to use uh, encryption, we do that um, via public key infrastructure on port 443, and then we use like TLS or SSL encryption is used to like encrypt the connection and all the you know um, public key of the web servers used to um, like encrypt communications and things. And um, we you know we'll come back to this topic later, but basically. We have a, a way of um, either having encrypted connection with the server or in the clear connection with the server. Again, as time's moved on, we're more and more away from kind of doing websites in the clear to using encryption because um, that protects against a bunch of different kinds of attacks uh, that happen if we're not using encryption on our connection with the server. <clears throat> So HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's a request response protocol. 
Um, so it's an application layer, so it sits on top of TCP. Um, you have a client, which is the um, user agent, for example, a web browser, and it connects to the server, and it makes a request, and it makes it by sending this message. So to say, um, there will be a um, the kind of request being made. For example, a GET request will just retrieve information, and then the um, URL or the actual like re um, resource that's being requested. For example, index.html. The protocol that the client supports will tell the server that, and the the host that it thinks it's connecting to, um, and that is necessary nowadays because a single website web server might be hosting up multiple websites, so you just tell it which website you're trying to access, and it will respond with the actual code of the website. So it will respond with something that looks like this, which includes, um, you know, again the version of the protocol it's using, a response code, and the word the number two hundred basically just means it's all fine, and a message that says it's okay, and then some headers, um, followed by the actual HTML content uh, that gets rendered in the browser. So this is all what happens over the um, over the network, and then the web browser takes this and turns this into something that's presentable to the user. So you know, in this case, there's the title of the the page will get rendered in and in the um, you know title in the tab at the top of the web browser, for example. And in this example, it's got the body text is literally just some plain text that just says it's a simple HTML document. Um, but I don't know, maybe we should let's have a look at this in um, real life. Um, all right. So if we want to look at um, at, a, at a real life example of that. Um, we could use netcat that is to talk to um, via TCP IP um, to uh, example, for example, dot com uh, on port 80. And it makes the connection and the server's waiting for us to say what we want. Um, so we could type something like um, get, um, say, index.html. Uh, we have to tell it which protocol again, so which version of HTTP we know about. Now, we think we're talking to um, example.com. Uh, and it responds back with, um, you can see here, it's come back with some headers um, and, uh, and then the actual website itself. Here. Um, and so there's some style information which is um, you know just like what fonts and things to use and the actual content here is just that it's an example domain um, and so that's the actual text and if we were going to render that in a web browser it would show us you know whatever was you know it would render that for us using this information um, you know we could do the same for um, say Google But what we will find there is that um, with Google, the response will include a lot more JavaScript and things, so it'll be not quite as easy to read. Um, but you can see it's the same concept. Okay, so told us we've used the wrong server. So I think if we use um, www prefer it. So you can see here um, you know the Google homepage has quite a lot more going on. Um, and um, but yeah the it's basically it's the same concept. The the website, a lot of this is JavaScript um, code that is going to run inside the web browser. Um, but this is all just content that's served up to the web um, browser, and it gets rendered inside the web browser, and um, stuff happens. 
so you know originally the the internet was mostly made up of static HTML pages so you know the first example we looked at there with example.com um, where it, you know it's probably there's literally a .html file that sits on the server when, when we access it the server just provides that to us um, and it just reads it uh, but then as time has gone on you know we had the web 2.0 in the 90s or you know like mid 90s the things started to like um, move towards having interactive web pages where you could click on things or you could put your mouse over something and it would change and you know more in making websites more interesting um, and you know that a lot of that just comes from um, you know including things like JavaScript and styling and things inside the web pages um, and kind of the in what we have now is that we can have code that runs on the server side and there's also code that executes inside the browser so on the server side of things you will typically have something like PHP or Java or Ruby on Rails is my personal favorite for building websites but all these different technologies that basically you have a web server running and it's doing stuff that generates content and that gets sent to the client to the web browser so like we just saw and that can include code so we you know as we just saw on the um, Google example there's a bunch of JavaScript there um, and you know back in the day you might have had flash but thankfully we're moving away from that um, and you know other things like Silverlight in the, which was Microsoft's like flash alternative and things like that but basically um, ActiveX was another common one back in the day but basically you have a bunch of code that happens that runs in the web browser um, the code on both sides is actually starting to be JavaScript a lot so you can you know you can actually build um, websites that where you have the JavaScript on the server side using node.js um, and stuff like that um, but you also you know most of the time the majority of the time the code that's happening inside the browser is JavaScript um, and then we have databases that are used to actually store and retrieve the actual like information so typically we have a SQL server or SQL server running on the server side and so the the web server uses the web, the database um, to build the website that you're interested in and then that gets sent along to the client which then gets rendered on the screen um, but you can also have um, you can actually have da databases local to the web browser as well so in HTML5 it, it provides a way that clients can provide can have um, databases within the web um, browser as well but <clears throat> I guess typically what you would see is you would have a um, database on the server and a web server um, they could technically be separate like computer systems um, but you have um, or just running on the same server and when the client makes a request the server accesses that database builds the website and sends it along and then um, you know gets rendered on the client side so what happens on the client side is the core technologies that make up a web browser uh, wake up a website, a web page, um, as it gets displayed on the client side of the equation is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So HTML is hypertext markup language, um, and it's it's a markup language that defines the content of web pages. So it looks like this. You just saw this. You just saw an example of this a second ago. Um, you know when we were looking. At the example here um, so you know the response to our request was this um, and this is HTML code here um, this HTML code happens to also include some styling but if we just look at you know this is all you know it's all HTML and it's the content so you can see here if you look at the body part of the HTML here it's all pure content 
and you know we will typically have um, you know opening and closing tags for HTML. It's loosely based on like an XML type um, um, document. So we've got these like uh, tags, these elements that um, kind of close off sections. So we've got a, the overall tag uh, around the whole thing is this element that says HTML. And then we've got a head. And inside head, we've got a title. Um, and as I said before, that's the thing that gets rendered in the tab or the, the um, app, you know, browser um, title bar. And then you've got the body, which is actually the website itself. And in this case, we've got H1, which is a heading. And it says, this is a heading. And we've got a paragraph that just says, hello world. Um, CSS, cascading style sheets, is what defines the presentation of the HTML content. So you can provide it inline um, or as a separate styling. So you can actually provide it, you can actually put the styling information in line within the HTML and it's generally considered bad practice. It's better to separate them out. Um, but here's an example. This could be in an HTML document and in the actual tag itself, it specifies the style as being red and then it um, you know then you've got a red heading um, so that's the word those are the words and it gets styled that way or you can actually put the style in um, in separately into the style section of the HTML document um, so again if we go back to our example here we've got a style element here and that includes a bunch of styling information which then gets applied to the content of the page. So here we've got a heading um, and yeah, actually if you look here they don't actually specify heading so the heading will use um, we'll just use whatever the default for uh, a website is so the browser will decide what that is. Um, but we're setting things on the body of the document like the background color margins, like what fonts to use. Um, <clears throat> there's a div um, that base is used that sets like a, a width that it, and you know background color for that. There's a really says border radius so it's going to put some curved corners on there um, and it's specifying the color of the links um, whether or not we've visited them regardless of whether we visited them. Um, and there's some information regarding um, what happens when there's different screen resolutions. So, you know, this is a nice simple example. It shows some st how styles can be used to style this document. Um, you can also put the style sheet not in the HTML document, but just link to it from within the, he the header. You can basically specify a link to an external um, styling um, style sheet. Um, and finally we have JavaScript which is the thing that makes websites interactive. So all modern web browsers in contain a JavaScript engine that's based on the ECMA script specification um, and so you basically the web browser, so in this case I'm using Chromium um, which is like Chrome or you can use um, like Firefox or Safari or whatever and each of those has their own way of um, running JavaScript and they're, they should be functionally identical but they're not. I mean there'll, there'll be some slight differences um, but the idea is they're based on a specification so that you can um, run some JavaScript inside a web browser, inside a website. So JavaScript itself is a weakly and dynamically typed programming language which is means that um, you know like variable types like strings and integers and things that it's not as clearly defined as say something like C um, or um, Java is a strongly typed um, programming language C is kind of weakly typed um, but being like dynamically typed for JavaScript means that you can like have a string in one variable and then stick an integer in it in the next instance and it, you know it'll be okay with that um, 
It can execute statements in strings at runtime. So, you know, you can do crazy things like um, build your own code within the code and then execute that code. Um, and the JavaScript can modify the environment or the DOM. So the, the DOM is the, the um, document object model. And so all HTML documents are internally modeled and accessed as a tree structure. Uh, and if you modify the DOM, it modifies the website. Um, and so JavaScript can add, change, and remove DOM elements and attributes. So JavaScript can completely change the contents of a website. JavaScript can um, control everything about what's happening on the website that you're looking at. Uh, JavaScript can just decide to re remove all the content of the website and replace it with some different content. Uh, you know, JavaScript can do all that stuff. Um, if you go to inspect um, within the web browser, you can see this, you know, this is the DOM here. So that, you know, the DOM is this structure, which is basically the, the HTML code. Um, and, you know, within that, you have, um, you know, so we've got an H2 element. Um, and JavaScript could do something like, you know, from within your JavaScript, you can um, do things like replace the, the contents of the DOM, and then the web browser will just instantly re-render the page to make it, to provide those updates to the user that's looking at the page. Uh, and, you know, JavaScript could also do things like just delete elements out of the um, DOM, and again, it will just be reflected. <clears throat> so, JavaScript libraries are like code, for JavaScript that's been written um, that you can use when building a website or when um, uh, you know building the client side part of a website. Uh, so things like jQuery add extra features and ways of coding websites. It may, there's a lot of convenience functions in jQuery compared to JavaScript. <clears throat> so a lot of websites use jQuery, and then you have so jQuery is like this. A bunch of shortcuts for writing JavaScript, and you can do a whole sorts of really cool stuff uh, with less code, essentially. And then you have other frameworks like Angular, React, Vue, um, and they change the way websites are developed. And a lot of these kind of like modern Java, um, pardon JavaScript um, frameworks, move towards being more and more and more of the functionality being in happening inside the web browser. Um, and so, you know, I talked about the fact that usually what happens is you have a server that generates the page and the content, including the JavaScript and everything, but it generates the, the website and then it feeds it to this, the web browser and it gets displayed. And JavaScript provides the frills of making it kind of interactive and things. Um, the more modern way of building a website, or the, the like, the thing that's in vogue at the moment, is basically having more and more happening within the client, and so less, <clears throat> less of the server generating the HTML, but actually the server might just provide a very bare um, HTML document that just says everything's like React, and then React will talk to the web server. <clears throat> to, to like ask for the, um, almost like querying the web server for um, like the content, which then gets rendered into HTML by React. And so we've got, it's basically the same thing except more is happening inside the web browser. So you've got a whole bunch of JavaScript code and the web server is often gets accessed more of a, as an API where it just responds to requests and gives gives the data directly. And then the the um, within the web browser, the JavaScript's doing more of the heavy lifting of you know generating the HTML content. And then you have things like single page web apps um, that are you you never like um, re-render the whole page again. It's basically everything happens one time you load up this website and then all the clicking that you're doing is actually just replacing parts of the page with more new content. 
and you never do like a full refresh of the whole website again like it it just has react running for example and it just um or or angular or view and it just replaces parts of the website um so that's known as a, a single page web app um but still the the idea is similar you have um javascript running inside the web browser the web server is responding to requests it's just that they, they the requests change from being requests for um, HTML content to being requests to um, like specific API calls, which gets responded to with, with um, like a JSON um, data instead of HTML data, for example, which is just like a way of providing information. So in terms of the security, you need to think about the fact of, okay, so JavaScript can modify the environment, can modify DOM, um, there are some protections that mean that JavaScript can only access web resources. The JavaScript can't access the files on your computer, thankfully, obviously, except via user interaction. So a user, <coughs> you know, might be prompted to um, select a file on their local system, and then that will be giving the JavaScript permission to then access that file, and it can then read that information and provide it to the um, the website or the um, browser. You have um, same origin policy, which means that scripts from one website don't have access to the data from other websites. So, you know, when you have JavaScript running inside the web browser, if you have multiple tabs open, it could access the information from other tabs on that same website, but it can't then access um, the data from like other websites, for example, and you can't make requests <clears throat> against other websites. So single origin will stop it from making other kinds of requests. Um, but lots can go wrong, um, as you can imagine. There's a lot of interaction, a lot of um, dynamic code that's happening. Um, Ajax is um, where you have asynchronous JavaScript and, and XML is what AJAX stands for and it enables websites to change dynamically without reloading the entire page so it's a way that uh, you know the single page um, websites work uses a lot of AJAX but also um, even normal websites so when you use like our activity system um, Ajax is, you know, every element in it that just like updates dynamically and things is, uh, you know, there's an element of Ajax there. So there is, um, basically you've got a website that's running and the JavaScript can make a request from a web server for more information. Um, and it does that via the XML HTML request. Um, the the fact that this is XML in the type in the function name is a bit misleading. I think the original idea was that it would just return some XML content, but that's not actually the case. Uh, typically, it will respond with JSON or XML, um, and the JavaScript receives it and then uses that to update the DOM. So the JavaScript makes a request, gets the answer back, and updates the um, the DOM based on the response. So um, content management systems are typically their server-side code that runs and it's a framework for building websites. So WordPress is huge, it's like 29% of the entire web. So like 29% of all websites in, in the world are based on JavaScript. Um, and there's other CMSs like uh, Joomla, Drupal, Sitefinity, um, most of those are written in PHP for whatever reason. Um, and they're designed to enable non-technical people to update the content. So it makes it easy to build a website because if you can throw together a WordPress website really easily, um, you know, you can include like, you know, you build a blog site um, is, you know, what WordPress was originally designed for. But you can literally build any website, basically any simple website that has a bunch of like static content or you know that you want to be able to update um wordpress is perfect for that kind of thing 
Um, even building um, commerce websites and things is a huge plugin in plugin um, um, ecosystem for WordPress where you can install various plugins to add various features to your website. Um, so it's very extendable, um, but CMSs and extensions can have vulnerabilities. So there's been loads of WordPress um, plugins that have had severe security problems. So every WordPress website that had a specific plugin that was installed was vulnerable to attack. Uh, and even versions of WordPress that have had various kinds of critical security problems in them. So, you know, one of the things to look at when looking at the website security is, okay, well, figure out what technology was used to build this website. If it's based on a CMS, are there known security problems in that CMS, um, you know, that are, are known about? Uh, WP scan, WordPress scan is um, a vulnerability scanner specifically for scanning WordPress websites, and it tests for um, misconfigurations and um, vulnerable versions. Um, so, you know, in addition to being used <clears throat> just for building websites, web services are used for machine to machine interactions. So, you know, you can have an interface used to query an online database, uh, and that can be called by mobile apps, but also other websites or software. So, one of the most common kinds of interfaces are RESTful APIs, um, which stands for representational state transfer uh, and basically you make individual requests to a service via a standard um, HTTP methods, a get, put, post, delete um, and uh, you know and, and the server responds with um, typically JSON or XML content. So for example um, over our like VM infrastructure has a RESTful API that Hacktivity uses to communicate with it. Um, and the, so you know, so you can interact with the API and to make various kinds of requests. And you know, that's quite common if you've got a web app that looks different. So if you install a, a, um, a mobile app, for example, on your Android or, you know, iOS device, um, if it looks different to the main website, so if it looks exactly the same, it could literally just be a wrapper around some HTML and it's just rendering the, the web browser is just, the web server is just providing the same HTML content to the web app, to the mobile app, and you're just interacting with the website, it happens to look like an app. Um, or if it's more of a native app, what it could be is, what it is often, is you've got some um, some native code, so for example, written in Java for an Android app, and that Java code is actually just talking to the RESTful API on the server to actually get the content, um, which gets provided as some JSON information about like the you know what it needs to display, and then the mobile app then you know decides how to use that, and then if you've built your website your web server that way based on RESTful API. Maybe when you browse the actual website, you could have something similar where it could be like a React based thing where the React code is actually just interacting with the same API that the, that the mobile app interacts with, for example. So web vulnerabilities, so vulnerabilities in frameworks um, and CMSs is something that you can look for. There's vulnerabilities in bespoke code is um, you know quite common so a lot of websites because they're built by people that often don't have a lot of security training they just you know know how to build a website and they'll um, write some you know it's very easy to make a mistake that ends up with a, a um, security vulnerability uh, and so you know you, you need to do things like fuzz testing which you'll learn about uh, in this um, you know in this module and the other thing you can look for is misplaced trust in the client, the server, or the users. So, for example, 
you might have a client side code, client side code so within the um, <clears throat> within the web browser, you might be asked to input some some something to the, that gets sent to the server. The web browser code might say might check it whether you've sent the right thing, and it might check first before it gets sent to the server that this is a valid thing to send. Um, that's all fine, but on the server side, we can't trust that the client's done that because. A, a malicious attacker is not necessarily using the client um, that has been provided. They might be, um, you know, sending their own requests directly to the server. So we misplaced trust if we assumed that the client was actually going to be doing that correctly. Um, similar, if you've got a lot of client-side code and you're trusting that the server's only sending the right kind of information, um, or that the users are inputting information correctly. So those are different things to think about. Um, browser or sandbox implementation errors. So if a web browser itself has security problems built in um, into it, then that could be a huge problem. Over time, those sorts of problems have been discovered less frequently, but certainly there have been lots of security problems that have been discovered in all the most popular web browsers um, that have been critical security problems in. And so just by getting um, just by getting someone to visit your website, if they've got a vulnerable web browser, you could basically um, compromise their computer and um, you know take control of their of their computer if they've got a security vulnerability in the browser itself. Thankfully, that's less common now, but it's still possible. Um, and yeah, there are kinds of security mistakes that are really commonly found in web. Um, um, websites. And so OUWASP top 10 um, list the most common um, security vulnerabilities, but we'll come back to that um, throughout the module. Web proxies is a way for security testers to tamper with the behavior of clients and servers. So, you know, there's things like Burp Suite and um, OUWASP Zap of popular web proxies and allows us to basically do things that the web server um, or client are not expecting. Um, and a vulnerability scanner. Um, things like Nessus and Nexpose have web scanning features. So you can scan a website. And there's also specialist tools for auditing websites. So again, Burp Suite and OWASP Zap have um, some features built into it to do automated testing. In addition to all the like manual testing that you can do, um, W3AF has um, like a automated scans that can happen. Nikto has some scans as well, um, although it's kind of looking for uh, sort of server misconfiguration problems mostly. Um, but you know, there's a whole bunch of tools that you can use that do automated scans. Um, you can also use spiders to crawl over a website to to download copies of of web pages. And content. Um, so, you know, you basically it just um, kind of automates the process of de accessing web websites in order to download the content, uh, which is how, you know, like Google does its indexing of content and things. Um, but, it, you know, it's kind of like a snapshot in time of what the server will respond. Uh, you don't, you can't capture the server side. Um, information directly. You can only ac access what the server feeds through in terms of the website. So, you know, you have spiders that will crawl over the content and download it. Um, it might be able to identify versions of frameworks and interesting content. Um, so there are ways that you can basically look at a website, look at what's come back and try and figure out what frameworks and things it's built on so that you know what to think about. So you can use automated scans to find obvious issues, but manual testing is most likely to be required to find less obvious flaws. Um, because detecting code involves, <clears throat> because detecting like these kinds of programming mistakes involves interacting with the server a lot, um, with malicious code, there's a high risk that you're going to have some impact on the actual servers. Um, compared to other kinds of networking scanning you might, might want to do, so you need to be aware of that. Um, 
Metasploit Pro and Nexpose both have web scanning features. Um, Metasploit Pro has more offensive and exploitation capabilities and, and can actually deliver a payload. Um, so, in conclusion, um, you know, web security is it's ever growing importance. We've looked at lots of different technologies. Um, so we've looked at HTTP, HTTPS, which is the encrypted um, version. Um, we have looked at HTML as being the markup code, CSS being the styling, JavaScript uh, providing the dynamic content of a website, looked at content management systems, talked about how a lot of the server sides are programmed in things like PHP, Java, or Ruby, um, or even JavaScript nowadays, and then on you know, compared to on the client side, which is JavaScript is providing the dynamic code within the web browser. Um, there are automated tools um, that exist so you can scan for obvious problems, but you're going to need to um, provide some more sophisticated approaches to testing, like manually testing. Um, and yeah, so I mean, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. I hope that that's helped you to understand a bit more about the the overall landscape of how websites work and the kind of interactions that happen. If you've not heard about things like React before and you know that's all uh, quite overwhelming, I can appreciate you know I've distilled down um, like decades worth of progress and um, you know talked about quite a few different ways that websites work. But hopefully you walk away from with this, from this with a good understanding about the basics of the fact that you've got the server. Generally speaking, that's like building a website, it gets fed to the client and it gets rendered inside the, the web browser. And just so that you're aware of the fact that some modern um, websites and things will do things slightly differently. Um, and yeah, so hopefully you've got a good understanding now. I hope that's been interesting and helpful. And if you've got any questions, then, um, you know, we can discuss.